God is good, church. And all the time. I want to welcome you to uh, week two of our Practice Makes Perfect sermon series. And we've been talking, uh, we started looking at some things that we need to, to brush up on in order to become successful in our journey to follow Jesus. Amen? I mean, how many of you are here to follow Jesus today? Yeah. I mean, we're trying to get better at this every single day. We're trying to grow in this area of our lives. And so last week we talked about how important it is to be in God's Word every day. And if you remember, I challenged you. I asked you to take the seven-day challenge with me. And so I want to I want to just, we're going to call each other out. How many of you had a successful week either reading or listening to God's Word every day? Raise your hand. Look at that. Isn't that awesome? Yes, give yourselves a hand for that. All right, now let me, I want to just hear a quick, couple of quick one-sentence testimonies about what God did in you because you did that this week. Anybody just want to share? Go ahead, Brandy. Amen. Yes. And did you have a better week because of it? That's what I like to hear. Back here. Oh, no. I don't think that had anything to do with him reading the word, but all right, maybe that's right. Maybe so. Missy. Amen. That's awesome. What else? Anybody else? Something, Dotty. All right. Praise God with that, Jerry. Amen. Yes, Charmaine. Awesome. Guys, God's word will do all these things, right? He'll lift us up. He'll encourage us. He'll put us in alignment. He'll put us where we need to be. What encouraging words. Keep it up. I want to challenge you to keep doing that. Those of you who already did it, you know the benefit of it. Those of you who are already doing it every week already anyway, you know how, how great it is. Those of you who haven't started, start today. It's not too late. And if you don't start today, start tomorrow. Somebody say amen. Amen. Yeah, so that's what we're going to do. Now, today we're going to move on, and we're going to focus on prayer. Now, before every major event in Jesus' life, guess what he was doing? Praying. He was praying. Every major event in his life. Before he preached the most important sermon of his life, church, God, or Jesus, was on his knees. Before he met with the critics that he had to face all the time. Jesus was on his knees. Before he healed and he raised people from the dead, Jesus was in prayer. Before he was teaching his disciples to do anything, Jesus was in prayer. And you found him all the time. If you look through the scriptures, the gospels, you'll find Jesus all the time making his way off by himself. What do you think he was doing? He was in prayer. See, Jesus knew something that you and I have got to learn, if we haven't already learned it, is that Jesus needed to be with his father. He needed to be with his father. He needed to learn from him. He needed to be guided by him. He needed to connect with him. He needed some encouragement from him. He needed to listen to him. He needed to spend time with him and to connect with his father every single day. And he knew that he couldn't survive without that connection. That's exactly what prayer is, church. It's a connection with our Heavenly Father. It's a time for us to get connected to the God of the universe, to learn from Him, to get direction and encouragement from Him. How many of you need some encouragement from a father in your life? How many of you need direction? Absolutely. How many of you need to be guided? Absolutely. I need that in my life. I need quality time with my father. I need to be in relationship with him. And the amazing thing is, are you ready for this? The God of the universe wants to be in relationship with you. Right? He wants to be in relationship with you. That is a crazy thought, isn't it? Now, in the Bible, prayer is described as one of our greatest weapons. It's described that says, it says that God's word says that prayer can change our reality, that it can heal us, that it can control the forces of nature, that it can bring the dead back to life. Somebody say amen. 
that it can help us to overcome fear and frustration, that it can keep us alert and sober-minded, that it can guard us against temptation, and maybe most importantly, that it will cause the enemy to lose his battle against me and against those I love. I want you to listen to that list. Think about that list for a minute. That's powerful stuff, right? This is what prayer can do, right? Prayer is one of our greatest weapons and one of our greatest assets as we try to grow closer to Jesus. And so that's an awesome thing, amen? And so here's the question I have for you as we get started this morning. If prayer is something that Jesus spent a significant portion of his life doing, if prayer is such a powerful tool and such an asset to us as we grow in our relationship with God, then why in the world don't we utilize it more? Why are we utilizing it more, right? I think I have an answer to that. And here's the answer. I think we don't utilize prayer more because I think we are under the impression that prayer is hard. Turn to your neighbor and say, prayer is hard. If you think prayer is hard, raise your hand. If you think prayer is hard, raise your hand. I want you to notice that my hand is up, church, because I've discovered for me, prayer is one of the hardest things in the world to do, right? I mean, in fact, every other discipline I can think of in the Christian walk for me, this is just me speaking for me, is easier for me than prayer. For a lot of reasons we're going to talk about in just a minute, but I find it way easier to read God's Word every day than I do to get on my knees. I find it way easier to sacrifice some of my time and to give God some of my tithe and my talents, right, than I do to get on my knees in prayer every day. I find it easier, I find it a whole lot easier to be alone and to be quiet. By the way, that is, a, that is saying something for me, amen? <laughs> I find it a whole lot easier to be alone and to be quiet than I do to be on my knees in prayer. I find it easier to be in confession with other brothers and sisters than I do to be on my knees in prayer. I find it easier to love my enemies. <laughs> yeah, 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 let's back up a minute, right, Bob? <laughs> that sounds crazy. But that's how hard I find prayer sometimes, right? And I think we find prayer hard for lots of reasons. Number, number one reason I think we find prayer hard is because I think sometimes we think it seems strange. You ever think prayer seems strange? I mean, here's the thing. I'm supposed to be having a constant conversation with the God of the universe. Now, most of the time when I'm having a conversation, I can, I can give my brother a hug, right? I can shake his hand. I can talk to him. I can hear his voice, right? I know what he's saying to me. He knows what I'm saying to him. I know him when I hear him, right? Yeah. It's kind of a weird dynamic to try and have a conversation with somebody I can't see. And somebody whose voice I don't always recognize. Amen? So it's a weird dynamic. It seems a little bit strange, right? I also find it's hard because prayer is a discipline. How many of you like that word discipline? Raise your hand. (laughs) I hate the word discipline, church. Because the first thing, when I hear that word discipline, you know what the first thing I think of is? Punishment. Right? That's what I always thought about discipline growing up is discipline means punishment. But I want you to know this morning, church, that discipline is so much more than punishment, right? Discipline is training. Turn to your neighbor and say, discipline is training. Yeah. How many of you watched the Winter Olympics at all this year? Anybody? What was your favorite event? Curling. What else? Ice skating. What else? Snowboarding. Okay. Okay. So my favorite event, are you ready for this? Don't you tell anybody outside this room, all right? This is between us. I love the couple's figure skating, man. See, this is why you can't tell anybody. Smart, Alec, right? You know why I loved it so much? It's so cool to watch two people be so in sync, right? I'm sitting there and I'm watching them. It's just an amazing thing to watch. But, but I, think, I think about what it takes for people to get there. And, you know, it doesn't happen overnight, right? I mean, it takes hours and hours of practice every single day for months and months and months to get to the place where you can be as in sync as they are, right? Now, there are days, I'm guaranteeing you, there are days when they don't feel like being in practice, amen? There are days when they're hurting, their bodies are aching, they don't want to be on skates. There are days when they would rather be doing anything else, and yet they do it. They get out on those skates every single day and they rehearse and they train because they know that if they're ever going to win the gold, they got to get out there and get this done to be the very best. And so they train, right? Prayer is a discipline. Prayer is training. It's something that you have to do in order to learn how to do it. Amen? 
That's how prayer works. Training for prayer happens as you pray. It's just like any other relationship. I don't always feel like being in relationship. Somebody say amen. amen. I don't always feel like having a conversation. I don't always feel. I'm a, sometimes you make me mad, and I don't want to talk to you, right? I love you, but it's true, right? There are just moments of our lives where we just need that space. But guess what? Here's what I've learned is that if I don't just go after this and get it done, it's going to affect my relationship. And so we need the training. We just jump in and we do it. Amen? Now, here's another thing that makes prayer hard. Another thing that makes prayer hard is that it requires listening and waiting. Turn to your neighbor and say, listening and waiting. I got this top five list of things that I cannot stand doing, and listening and waiting are on both of them, or are on my list. I do not like to listen, right? The truth of the matter is, I, I care a whole lot more about what's happening in my life than I do most of the time than I do everybody else. Isn't that true about all of us? I mean, we want to say that, we're, that we care about what's happening with everybody else, and at a level I think we do, but when it right, comes right down to it, we seem to be way more concerned about what's happening in our own lives than we are about what's happening in each other's lives. Amen? I'm, I'm way, way more concerned about what I want and what I need and what I think than I am about what you want and what you need and what you think. I love you, but I'm just being real. Amen? And the truth is, you do the same thing to me. So don't pretend like you don't. Amen? Right? But here's what I've learned, church. I get so consumed with that stuff that, that I start to not listen, and all of a sudden it affects every relationship in my life. And it's no different than my relationship with God, right? If I'm ever going to really grow in my relationship with Him, I have to learn to listen. Prayer is hard because it means I have to listen. Whew. It also means I have to wait. I am one of the most impatient people I know on the planet. I don't like to. <laughs> I didn't say, say amen, okay? <laughs> this is quite a bunch. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I am. I don't like to wait for anything. Man, please, I beg you, don't make me wait in line. Don't make me. There is nowhere I hate waiting more than the stoplight. I don't like to wait for results or answers to anything. I don't like to wait. How many of you love waiting? Nobody likes to wait. See, it's not just me. Right? That's right. Nobody likes to wait. But you know what I've learned? is that God doesn't think the way I think, and God certainly is not operating on my timetable. Somebody say amen. And so what I've learned is that God is going to do things the way God's going to do them, and if I don't want to get on board with it, I'm going to be in trouble. So one of the things I've learned about prayer is that it's, it's a discipline in waiting. Right? And so i got to learn to listen and wait, and that's why we have such a hard time with prayer. There's one more thing that makes prayer hard. And this is going to be our springboard into the thing that we're going to do together today. But one more thing that makes prayer hard is that I don't know what to do or say, and I don't know how to do or say it. Now, let's just be honest with, with each other for a minute. Have you ever had a moment where you felt like you needed to pray, but you had no idea what to say? Yeah. Raise your hand if that's you. Yes. Yeah. Pretty much everybody in the room has been there before, right? Because sometimes it's just baffling. I, I, I mean, I know what I want on my heart. I know, I know what feels heavy, but I don't even know how to start. I don't know what to say. I don't know when to say it. I don't even know the appropriate way to say it so that God will hear me, right? We've all been there. And so, that, I mean, it makes it hard, right? But here's the thing I want you to hear. When you first learn to do anything, it's hard. How many of you, when you got on your bike for the very first time, if you know how to ride a bike, you knew what you were doing? How many of you knew? Anybody? I mean, how many of you just got on that thing and you started riding and you're pedaling away and you're able to navigate that thing and you knew how to stop it? Anybody know how to do that? No. All right. With no training, right? That's what I'm saying, right? What do we do? I, man, I needed help. I don't know the first, I still don't know how to ride a bike. I mean, it's kind of scary, actually. Go ahead and ride with me sometime. It'll be, it's dangerous for all of us, right? I get on a bike, and I'm like, I struggle, right? And I, I wasn't great at it forever, right? Some of us, we get on that bike. I, what I know for sure is that nobody gets on the bike 
and knows what they're doing the moment they get on, right? How many of you remember your first date? <laughs> Two people raised their hand. <laughs> hey, that's right. Everybody else is blocking it out. They're like, <laughs> I don't, I don't. that first date is terrifying, right? I was so scared. And you know what I did when I, start, when I was on that first date? I was looking for every expert I could find to ask for advice, right? I mean, uh, people were so sick of talking to me about that first date because I, didn't, I was so terrified of going on that first date. And what I learned is, guess what? When I'm trying to figure out how to do some of this stuff, I need an expert, right? And so here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to seek the expert on prayer. How's that sound? I think if we're trying to figure out how to do the prayer thing well, if we're going to figure out how to connect in relationship to this amazing God who loves us so much, then we ought to go to the expert and learn from him. Jesus was the expert at this thing, right? His disciples thought they knew how to pray, right? They thought they knew what they were doing. I mean, they'd been, many of them had been praying their whole lives. They were, many of them were good Jews. They'd gone to temple. They'd said all their prayers. They went through all of their rituals, and then they started hanging out with Jesus, and they noticed that when Jesus prayed, things started to happen, right? I mean, he would pray, and all of a sudden, the, the, somebody get healed. Or he would pray, and all of a sudden, he would get this word of knowledge or this word of wisdom, and he'd start preaching, and people would be like, wowed by what they heard. And all of a sudden, it occurred to them they wanted what they saw in Jesus. They wanted an intimate relationship with this father that they didn't really know, even though they thought they knew him. They wanted to be able to, to see God's healing power work through them. They wanted to experience all of that. And so they came to Jesus and they said to him one day, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Because they knew that if they were going to learn, they ought to learn from the expert. Amen? And so this morning we're going to learn from the expert. We're going to learn to pray from the one who knew all about prayer, who had a connection to the Father that we long to have, the one whom we're trying to learn to follow. We're going to learn how to do that. And so if you've got your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6. And we're going to start in verse 5, and we're going to make our way through verse 15, and we're going to break this up. And over the next few minutes, here's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through step by step this prayer and as we walk through it, then we're going to take some time and we're going to actually pray. And I'm going to invite you to do one of two things. You can pray all by yourself. You don't have to pray with anybody else if you don't want to. Or you can pray with the people right next to you, the person next to you, the, person in the, the people in the circle with you. Whatever you're most comfortable with, the only thing I'm asking you to do is to, is to follow along and pray with us. Okay? Here's the second thing. There's a sermon notes page on the inside of your bulletin. I want to encourage you to fill that out today. If you never fill it out again, fine. I want to encourage you to fill that out today because as you do, you're going to have a guide for prayer for the rest of your life. Who's excited about that? Amen. Yeah. This is a kind of an exciting thing. And so I want to encourage you to do that as we look at this together. Now, this prayer in Matthew chapter 6, does anybody need one of those outline sheets, by the way? All right, we can get you one if you need one. This prayer in Matthew chapter 6 is a familiar prayer to almost everybody in this room. How many of you have ever prayed the Lord's Prayer before? Yeah. So this is where the Lord's Prayer is found. It's in Matthew chapter 6, right? And it was the model that Jesus laid out for the disciples when the disciples asked, Lord, teach us to pray. And this is how he taught them to pray. And so we're going to walk through it together. And he taught us a whole bunch of great things about prayer in this passage, here's the first thing that Jesus taught about prayer. The first thing that Jesus has to say about prayer is that prayer ought to be done with the right focus and the right heart. Prayer ought to be done with the right focus and with the right heart. Starting in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says these words. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Somebody say hypocrite. hypocrite. Who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private, and then your Father who sees everything will reward you. Verse 7, when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words over and over again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask. What stands out to you here? Yeah. 
<laughs> you don't have to go all the way to Detroit, amen? That's right. <laughs> it's right. The truth of the matter is, here's what Jesus, I, this is what I take from this. What Jesus is trying to say is, if you're praying to be recognized by anybody but Jesus, then your focus is in the wrong place. Amen? If you're praying to be recognized by anybody else, then your heart isn't where it needs to be. Jesus was in a constant battle with the Pharisees over this very issue, right? How many times did the Pharisees stand up and they're, and they're in prayer and they would just, man, they would just go on with these sophisticated, long, drawn-out prayers that would last for days on a, at a time, right? And they would just pray and they would just pray. And their whole focus was to be recognized. They wanted people to see how educated they were. They wanted people to know how good they were and how holy they were. They wanted to be recognized, and Jesus was disgusted by it because it wasn't about that. He wasn't, he, Jesus is not concerned about fancy words, amen? amen? Jesus is concerned about one thing. He's concerned about the state of your heart. And he wants to know that your heart is bent toward him when we're on our knees seeking out a relationship with the Father. That's all it's about, right? This, this passage isn't about what, praying out loud and praying with other people around. God's not trying to tell you that you can't pray with other people. He's not trying to tell you you're not allowed to pray out loud. What he's saying is, if your motive is anything but me, then you're in the wrong place. Amen? And so here's what we're going to do. As we get started this morning, I want to just invite you by yourself. This one's by yourself. I want you to just take a moment, and I want you to bow your head, and I want you to close your eyes. And I want to just invite you to take a moment, and I want you to ask the Father to humble your heart as you enter into a conversation with Him. We need humble hearts. We can't begin really having a conversation with the Father if we come with pride. Amen? Because then it's all about us. And if it's all about us, we'll never have a relationship with Him. Amen? So we've got to clear that out of the way. Now, here's what else we learn from Jesus' prayer. We, uh, we learn also that prayer should recognize God for who God is. Prayer should recognize God for who God is. Somebody say amen. amen. I love how Jesus opens this prayer. He says, our Father in heaven. Now, I want you to take a minute. And I want you to think about that for just a minute. When you hear that word Father, what comes to mind? For some of you, Father gets, gets you all warm and fuzzy inside, right? For some of you, you're like, man, I can think of a person in my life who loves me and has nurtured me along the way, who has, has spoken into my life, who's challenged me, who's, who's reminded me how great I am, who's, who's, who's taught me that I'm something special. For some of you, it's a beautiful thing. And for some of you, this image of Father is kind of scary. You never had a Father. Or maybe the Father you did have was abusive and, and terrible to you. Whatever image you've got of a father in your mind right now, here's what I want you to know. Jesus came to reshape your image one way or the other. Because no matter how loving your father was, what God is trying to say to you is that he loves you more than anyone ever has. Right? That he pours out his life in, in ways that no father you've ever had ever could. He, he loves you more than life itself, more than anything else in all of creation. In fact, he made creation with you in mind. In fact, he made it for you. Right? He loves you in a way that you, and with a love that not even the best fathers can love you. And for those of you who had great fathers, you can go, wow, that's amazing to think about. Right? He's nuts about you. There's nothing he wouldn't do. There's no expense that he wouldn't spare for your good. He paid the ultimate price that's ever been paid for you. And a father who loves you like that deserves your love back. Amen? And so one of the things that Jesus teaches is, look, when you've got a father who loves you like this, you need to make sure that you let him know how much you love him. I mean, isn't that a natural thing? When you're in a relationship with somebody who loves you, don't you want to tell them that you love them? Yeah, and so that's one of the things that we ought to be doing in prayer every time we come to the Father is telling Him how much we love Him. Now, he goes on in this prayer, and he says, May your name be kept holy. In other versions, Jesus prays it like this, and this is the way we've prayed it if you've ever prayed the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be your name. 
That word hallowed means to honor or to respect or to cherish, right? God our Father is to be honored and cherished and respected because of who He is and because of what He's done. Somebody say amen. amen. The people of Israel recognize this. In fact, the people of the Bible recognized over and over again this great God of theirs, and they recognized Him by calling Him by all kinds of names. As they got to know God, they, they put a new name on Him because they were He was so big, they were just trying to wrap their brains around who this God was. And so they, they would, every time they experienced something, they would call God by a different name. They called Him Almighty God because there was nothing He couldn't do. Amen? They called him all-sufficient God because what they learned is that when God's in your life, I don't need anything else. Amen? When they learned that, they, that he could be called all-knowing God because he sees everything and he sees everywhere and there's nothing that I can do to hide from him the truth about anything. Amen? He's a provider. He's a healer. He's a God of peace. He's a God of justice. He's always been there. He will always be there. He's always going to be the God who doesn't change. Amen? So Jesus said, look, when you start out in prayer, come to this Father and tell Him how much you love Him. Come to this Father and tell Him how grateful you are for what He's done in your life. And so here's what we're going to take a few moments to do. Either by yourself or in the circle where you are, I want to invite you just to take a few moments. And I want you to thank Him for who He is and what He's done. And I want you to tell Him how much you love Him. Just take a few moments. The band's going to play some music in the background as you do that, and then we'll come back together. Father, we love you. What part of us that is struggling with that tonight, today, because we maybe don't even really know what love is, God, we ask you to show us today. Show us how you've loved us so that we can love you back appropriately. Help us to be grateful for what we have, for what you've done for us. Thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Prayer should recognize God for who God is. Amen. Prayer should also recognize God and what God desires. Prayer should, should seek what God desires for our lives. I want you to take a look at the next verse. Jesus prays this. He says, May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's Jesus essentially saying here, church? He's essentially praying, God, I want your will, not mine. I want to do this your way and not mine. And, and church, that's totally countercultural. Amen? Because this is not how we live our lives. It's certainly not something that we pray for. In fact, most of our prayers, let's be honest, are about what we want God to do for us. Amen? But this is the opposite of that. This is a recognition that God desires, His desires and His ways are higher than my ways, right? That God has a better plan than I have for the world and for my life. Somebody say, uh-oh. Uh -oh. See, the truth is I always thought I had a great plan for my life, and, and I find over and over again that my plan's not very good, but that His is really good, right? He's got a great plan. So, so Jesus teaches us to pray for His will and not for ours. And so here's what we're going to do for the next few moments. We're going to just pray for God to have His way. We're going to pray for God to have His way in our lives. We're going to pray for God to have His way in our world. And you can do that by yourself, or you can do that in your small group, whatever way you want to do that. But let's just take a few moments and ask God to give us what He wants to give us, to show us His way. Father, we want your way and not our own way. And where that's not true, we ask you to change our hearts. 
Help us to see that your ways are higher than our ways, that your plans are higher than our plans, that your desires are better than our desires, that at the end of the day, if we follow you and follow your lead, that we'll find the abundant life that you promise. And so not my way today, but yours. Not my will today, but yours. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I want you to notice something here. We're about halfway through the prayer before Jesus asks for anything for himself. Yeah, somebody say, "Uh uh-oh. Yeah. Before he ever asked for anything for himself, he's halfway through the prayer. He's given God thanks and praise and, and told him how much he loved him. He's, he's come to the Father and he said, not my will, God, but yours. And now he comes and he asks for what I need. Now I want you to hear this. God delights in hearing your voice. Do you believe that? He delights in hearing your voice. He wants to hear from you. And he doesn't care in what format he hears it. He just wants to hear from you, Right? He even loves to hear what's going on in your life and how broken you feel and how lost you feel and how far away from Him you feel. He wants to hear that because He loves you and He cares about what's going on in your life. Amen? And so what Jesus is modeling for us is it's okay to ask Him for what I need. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's okay to ask Him. It's okay to ask Him for what you need. Now I want you to notice that that word need is in quotations, right? Because the truth of the matter is that so often we come to Him with what we perceive to be a need, and the truth is that it's way more self-serving than that, right? Yeah. How many times you gone to God and you ask Him for something you really wanted, but you probably didn't need it? Somebody? Oh, yeah. Anybody? Yeah. If you ever went and bought a lottery ticket, why were you doing that? <laughs> did you need that or did you want it? Right? Most of the time it's something we want, Right? And it happens the same way with us, right? In all of our prayer lives, the truth is that we go seeking God for lots of things that we want. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that it's always wrong to pray for something you want. When I want healing for somebody that I love, it's okay to pray for that, right? When I desire for God to do something different in my life, I should be praying for that. But the truth is that His desire for us and the best thing that we could be doing is to be seeking God's desire and need. What, what is it I really need? What is it I really need? I want you to notice something about this prayer. He says, give us today the food that we need. Now, in the prayer that you're used to praying, the Lord's Prayer, how do we say it? We say, give us today our daily bread. Now, notice he wasn't asking for bread for tomorrow. He wasn't asking for bread for next week. He wasn't asking for security because Jesus knew that the moment that we start asking for security, all of a sudden we lose our focus on who's giving us the good things. Right? So we go and we ask for today's daily bread, just for today, just what I need for right now, because as long as I'm getting just what I need for now, I'm always dependent on Him. Amen? Always dependent on Him. Look at the Israelites. God promised the Israelites He was going to take care of them. And so over and over again, what would happen? Every day, He would rain down manna from heaven. And they would go collect just what they needed. And every time somebody collected more than they needed, guess what would happen? It would rot. Why? Because God said, look, man, I got this if you'll just trust me. So just ask me for what you need for today because I got your back. I'll cover you for tomorrow. Just trust me. I got you for next week. Just trust me. You don't need to worry about security because I am your God who loves you, and I will take care of you. Amen? And so he says, just ask for what you need for today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Come to me and seek just what you need for today, and that's what we're going to do right now. I want to invite you just to either by yourself or in your circle or however you want to do it, Just invite Him to show you what it is you need and then ask Him for what you need just for today. Let's do that now. Father, we come this morning And if we're honest, we have lots of things that we really want. Help us to see that all we need is you. Help us to put all of our trust in you.
Help us to come and seek you only and to watch as you provide for every need that we have and even blow us away in blessing us with those things that some of them that we want. We give ourselves to you and we trust you today for what we need today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, here's Jesus' next challenge to us. How many of you came in looking, needing forgiveness for anything today? Anybody? Yeah. Jesus says, you know what? There's space in God's heart for us to seek forgiveness. Amen? Prayer is an opportunity to experience forgiveness. He says, forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us, right? Now, according to Jesus, there are two things that we've got to do if we want to find forgiveness. The first one is we've got to ask. Turn to your neighbor and say, ask. Church, you've got to ask. You've got to come to the Father and you've got to say, Lord, here's what I've done. Be open and honest with Him and then ask Him to forgive you. But there's a second condition. He says the other thing you got to be able to do is you got to forgive others. Right? It seems so simple on the surface, and yet it's so hard because, first of all, it's hard to confess when I've done something wrong. I don't like to admit that I've done something wrong. Somebody say amen. Am I by myself? No. We don't like just me. That's right. I'm the only one. I hate to admit that I'm wrong. I hate it. And so do you. We all hate it, Right? But we have to confess, in order to be forgiven, we have to ask for it specifically. What sins have you committed? What is it that you need to be forgiven for? Tell him, ask him to forgive you. Now, here's the second part of that. If you want to be forgiven, you have to ask, but it doesn't stop there. Here's the second thing. He says, if you want forgiveness, you've got to learn to forgive others. If you look at the end of this prayer in verses 14 and 15, Jesus says this. He says, if you forgive those who sin against you, then your heavenly Father will forgive you. But, somebody say but. But. If you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. It's sort of a stark reality, church. We come seeking forgiveness, and yet the truth is, many times we're not ready to give it to somebody else. Somebody who we hold a grudge against or who is got some bitterness in my heart for whatever reason. Whatever's going on, you've got to figure out how to forgive them if you want to experience forgiveness in your life. Amen? And so here's what we're going to do in this section. I want to invite you. This is between you and God, okay? I want you to just take a moment, and I want you to ask God to show you where you need forgiveness in your life if you don't already know. And I want you to ask Him to give it to you. And then thirdly, because you can't be forgiven without this, Ask Him to show you who you need to forgive and to give you the strength to do it. Take a few moments and do that. Father, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry for being judgmental. I'm sorry for when I let my eyes wander in places they shouldn't. I'm sorry for the anger and the frustration that I hold towards people who've hurt me in the past. This morning I just ask you, forgive me. And as hard as it is to do, help me to help me to ask, knowing that I can't be forgiven until I forgive those who've hurt me. Give me the strength to forgive those over whom I'm holding a grudge or any bitterness or any frustration or any anger. Help me to set them free today so that I can be set free today. Do this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so there's one more thing. Jesus' prayer comes to a close, and this is what he says in his, in his closing line. He says, don't let us yield to temptation, 
but rescue us from the evil one. All this powerful stuff's going on in this prayer, and then Jesus comes and he says, there's one more thing that I want to encourage you and challenge you to pray for, and that one more thing is protection. How many of you need some protection in your life today? Church, I don't know about you, but I've, I've experienced the temptation is all around me, right? I mean, all around me, on every side. The enemy knows exactly where I'm weak, and he attacks me at my weakest point. He knows the people. He knows the places. He knows the things to put in my life and ruin right to put them in my life so that I will stumble if I'm not protected by him. Amen? Because I'm weak. I'm just calling it like it is. I will fall. I'm just like Paul. I know what I'm supposed to be doing, but I don't always do it. Right? But here's the truth. God is greater. Somebody say God is greater. God is greater than your temptation. God is greater than the enemy. And there's nothing that the enemy can do. And there's nothing that temptation can do as long as God is in charge. Amen? And the only way for God to be in charge of that in your life is for you to give it to Him. And so... Here's how we're going to close our time of prayer together. I want to invite you to take just a few moments, and I want you to ask God to protect you. And you can do that as individuals. You can do that in your circle, whatever you want to do. Ask God to protect you from the temptation that will get bombarded in your life and protect you from the enemy so you can have victory. Ask him now as we pray. Father, we come to you this morning for your protection. Every single one of us, for being honest, knows that we're under attack today. That the enemy is coming from all sides and he's throwing everything at us that he's got and he has every intention to steal and to kill and to destroy us. But in you he cannot, does not have the victory. In you, we have the victory through Jesus Christ. And so today, Lord God, we pray that you protect us, that you remind us of who you are, that you remind us of who we are in you, that you give us strength to stand and to overcome, and that we would stand on your word and find life and find it abundantly and win the victory. Protect us today in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to grab that yellow bulletin insert that you've been using. Guys, in just about 45 minutes there, we walked our way through a model for prayer. And a very simple model for prayer, but guys, here's what I believe. I believe that if you will do what you just did right now, every single day, it'll change your life. If you'll do what you just did right now, every single day for the rest of your life, it'll change your life. It'll change everything about, it'll change your circumstances, it'll change the way you think, it'll change your ability to think wisely about situations and circumstances, it will change everything. Do you believe that? I want to challenge you to do that. I want to challenge you to be on your knees, on your knees, standing up with your arms waving. I don't care how you do it. I don't think the Father cares how you do it. Get it done. Amen. Amen.